This conference will now be recorded. So I'd like to welcome everybody who's joining me today, Tuesday, November 16th, 2021, as we celebrate National Caregiver Month. And our topic today is the top 10 elder law questions and answers that caregivers need to know. Now, being a caregiver is not anything to be taken lightly. So for those of us who've been a caregiver, whether it's for our spouse, a parent, a sibling, or somebody else that we love, it is a full-time job. And I wanna remind all the caregivers that are joining us today, their number one priority is to first take care of themselves on all the levels, physically, mentally, stay healthy. Because only if we stay healthy can we take care of the person that we love? So I wanna send out a thank you to everybody who devotes their time and energy to caring for somebody else. Now I'm going to just ask you to let me know, either give me a thumbs up on your microphone if you're able to see the screen, yes? Okay. So today's top 10 list is really focusing on how caregivers can be effective advocates. And we start with very basic information, which is we wanna have correct information. We wanna dispel the myths that you hear, the rumors, and what I call my brother-in-law said. Because correct information is knowledge and knowledge is power. But if we don't have correct information, we're not going to make good informed decisions. So that's our base for today. Correct information is also important because that allows us to avoid making costly mistakes, that we get information from the internet that's not accurate from a friend or a relative. We're also gonna to touch on today why planning early is important because planning early gives us more planning options. And by planning early, it allows the person we're taking care of and us the caregiver to preserve being independent, documenting and writing what's important to us and maintaining the dignity of the person that you are caring for. So my goal today is to help you navigate through the 10 most challenging questions that I hear so that you can reach your goals and maintain your privacy. So let's get started. For those of you that might have been a David Letterman fan as I was, we're gonna approach this counting backwards. So we're gonna start with the number 10 most common myth that I hear from clients and that is, my relative can hold a pen and sign a durable power of attorney. He doesn't need to understand what he's signing. Well, that is a myth because being able to sign a legal document, such as a durable power of attorney, requires comprehension. It requires the ability to understand, not just the physical act of signing the document. So mental competency is crucial to any stage of legal planning, especially once somebody receives a diagnosis or it's after the diagnosis and now they're deciding it's time to plan. So the key here is that the earlier we plan, the better it is. Because if we wait until a later stage of an illness, that might impact the person's ability to understand what they're doing, understand the consequences, the outcome of signing a durable power of attorney. The lawyer they meet with may say, I'm not comfortable. I don't think this person is mentally competent. I will not write the document. And when that happens, the last alternative option we can offer is called a court-supervised guardianship. Now, ideally, we encourage people to get documents in place 
when they're healthy, when they're competent, because it allows them to make choices that they want rather than in a guardianship, a judge is making decisions for the person that's incapacitated. So the benefits to planning early are we're avoiding that crisis situation that occurs at the 11th hour. And by avoiding that crisis, we're not putting ourselves as the caregiver in a position where we're not gonna be able to think clearly or we're going to be so emotionally upset that we're not gonna make good decisions. By planning early when people are still mentally aware, we also save money. It costs less to create a legal plan than it's going to cost if an attorney goes to court to have the caregiver appointed a guardian for the person who's incapacitated. And probably as important as the cost is that ideally we all want to preserve our independence as long as possible. We want to be involved in decisions that affect our lives. Ideally, we want our lives to be private. We don't want them to be public. We don't want anything to be recorded in the public records, and we don't want anything to be accessible via computer because it's in a court guardianship proceeding. So documents like the durable power of attorney for financial decision making, or the document we call the designation of healthcare surrogate for medical decision making, don't get filed anywhere. They're not filed in a court. They're not filed in the county public record system. So people maintain their privacy and their dignity. But we are living in an electronic world, which means that any court proceeding could be accessed on the internet by the public. So the public can go to the Broward County Court website or any county you want to look at. You can type in the name of the person and it will show you what we call a docket sheet, which is a history of what has been filed in the case. So with a guardianship, there is very little privacy. It is a public record. So that's another reason to plan early and why timing is so crucial. And as I mentioned before, at least in the documents, we're assured that you're selecting the decision maker and you're communicating to that person what your preferences are, what's important to you, how do you feel, about certain types of medical decisions or financial decisions. And all that can be done without court oversight or court supervision. Now we're going to talk about the most common number nine myth that I hear, which is people saying, I can save money by paying a caregiver under the table. I'm not going to go through a licensed home health agency. Well, the reason that is a myth is you're really not saving money and you're potentially putting yourself and the person that you care about in a position where it can actually cost them more later on. So let me explain. When you go through a licensed home health agency to hire a certified nurse's aide or home health aide or perhaps a nurse, that agency carries what is called workers' compensation insurance, which simply means if that employee is injured when they're at your home on the job, the workers' compensation policy pays them for their injury. That protects you because the last thing we want is somebody who's paid under the table suing you because they got injured in your house. Perhaps they fell when trying to assist somebody in getting out of the bed into a chair or into their wheelchair. So having that workers' compensation not only protects you, but in the long run, it's saving you money. Another good reason 
to not be paying somebody under the table is because as an employee of the agency, when the agency pays them, they are also remitting employment taxes to IRS. When you're paying somebody under the table, you're most likely not paying those employment taxes to IRS, which you should be doing. And so by going through the agency, you don't have to deal with the issue of IRS coming back and saying, wait a second, where are the employment taxes that you should have paid? Another really important benefit of going through an agency is the agency is going to do a thorough background investigation on that employee, which you're not going to have the ability to do. And it's important because you're inviting somebody into your home to take care of somebody that you love. So you don't want to leave this to chance. You wanna have a thorough criminal background investigation done. You wanna know, were there any complaints filed against this person with the Department of Children and Families for abuse, neglect, or exploitation? And you wanna know if there was, <clears throat> what was the outcome of that investigation? And then what's a benefit not just to you, but to the person coming into your home providing the care is that by the home health agency reporting the income, remitting the payroll tax to IRS, the employee ends up earning social security credits and when they've accumulated 40 credits over a 10 year period, if they do become injured, they can apply and qualify for social security disability benefits, or when they reach age 65, they can apply to social security for retirement benefits. They're not gonna be able to do that if they've been paid under the table and neither you nor the employee has been paying any payroll taxes because there's no record of it. So these are reasons that you actually save money and it protects you and the person being cared for by going through an agency rather than paying somebody under the table. Now we're gonna talk about the number eight most common myth, which is my relative can pay me as a caregiver, but we don't need to have a written contract. Now, what people are usually referring to when they say this is called a personal service agreement. And this is a legal tool that can be used when an elder or even somebody who's younger, vulnerable adult, needs assistance. They need help to be cared for or to have their home cared for because of an illness that prevents them from being able to do that independently. So this type of agreement provides compensation to the caregiver in return for the services that they are providing. And under federal and state Medicaid law, this is an approved way of preserving assets and qualifying somebody for Medicaid assistance, but it must be in writing. It cannot be verbal. That is not acceptable to the Medicaid agency. So it requires a written contract which details everything that the caregiver is doing. It details how often during the month is this service provided? And it details how many hours a month are being spent providing the services. So for example, services might include bathing, dressing, providing meal preparation, laundry, linen services, house cleaning, food shopping, taking care of the house or the car, all of those are examples of personal services that can be compensated. And 
by being compensated, that is a way of lowering the countable resources that the incapacitated person has in their name so that they can meet the financial eligibility requirements to get Medicaid assistance in addition. So they can get Medicaid assistance in their own home, or perhaps they may need assistance while living in an assisted living facility or even a skilled nursing facility. The thing to remember is it can't be verbal, it must be a written contract, and it is not one size fits all. Not every caregiver is performing the same type of services as the next caregiver. So this contract is written and it's tailored to the needs of the caregiver and the person who's receiving the services. Another thing to just keep in mind is that under the personal service agreement, the person who's the caregiver cannot be paid prior to it being put in writing and signed. So if you've been a caregiver for several years and now you're first learning about this, you cannot be paid retroactively. You can only be paid going forward in time from when the contract is signed by both people. <clears throat> so now we're up to the number seven most common myth that I hear, which is I can gift $15,000 to protect my assets in case I need a nursing home. Now, this can be confusing because everywhere you turn, the newspaper, the internet, there's a lot of information about gift tax laws. Now, gift tax laws are different than the Medicaid laws. Under the gift tax laws, it says that each one of us can make an unlimited number of gifts every year. So let's say I win the lottery Saturday night and I win a million dollars. I can make gifts of $15,000 per person to as many people as I want. I can make gifts to my favorite teachers, uh, my family, my friends, charities. And if I stay within that amount of $15,000 per person or per charity, I don't need to call my accountant and have my accountant prepare a gift tax return. I'm also not going to pay any gift tax, and the people I've made the gifts to don't have to pay any gift tax either. Now, this is a great thing to do if you are charitably inclined, or it's a great thing to do if you're wealthy and you're trying to lower your overall assets so that you are potentially reducing estate taxes when you pass away. However, Medicaid does not share this same view as the tax law does. So under our Medicaid rules, and this is national, not just Florida, Medicaid is going to penalize anybody applying for assistance if they have made gifts within five years of applying for Medicaid assistance. So on an application, it will ask, have you given away <clears throat> any assets within the last five years? And if the answer is yes, it will ask the person applying to say, when were the gifts made, the month and year, and what was the value? So as a result of making gifts, it ends up delaying. It postpones when that person can actually get approved to receive Medicaid assistance. And there's no particular number, meaning there's no number of set days or months or weeks because it depends on the total value of the assets that were given away. So somebody who makes a small gift might have a shorter disqualification period, and somebody who makes a much larger gift will have a much longer 
disqualification period before they can qualify for Medicaid assistance. Now, there are two very narrow exceptions in the Medicaid law, and that is Medicaid protects the marital relationship. And what this means is if we have a spouse who is unexpectedly without warning ill, we can shift assets out of that spouse's name to the healthy spouse. And because the marital relationship is protected, there is no penalty, there is no disqualification for the transfers between spouses. The second exception in the law has to do with making gifts to a disabled child, not a healthy child, but somebody with a documented disability. So for example, if a child is receiving SSI benefits or social security disability benefits, that is sufficient to document that there exists a disabled child. And so any gifts or transfers of assets made to a disabled child are permitted under the Medicaid rules and will not cause any delay in the parent who is making the gift. There's no delay in them qualifying for Medicaid assistance. So when you hear somebody say, oh, it's all right, you can make a gift of up to $15,000 in case you get sick, be aware there is this five-year look-back rule. So we wanna be very careful about the timing of making any gifts. Now the sixth most common misconception I hear is when somebody says that they can make all types of financial decisions using a durable power of attorney of a relative. Now, the reason this is not true is not all durable powers of attorney are written the same way. And so a durable power of attorney needs to address what your personal financial situation is now and what may need to be done in the future if you were to become sick, ill, or incapacitated. So for example, let's say you own multiple pieces of real estate and somebody else doesn't, your durable power of attorney should specifically talk about giving permission to sell or to rent those real estate properties and should identify those real estate properties, not just by street address, but by legal description. Your situation is going to be different than your neighbor. Let's say there is a need to create a trust for you. Well, that has to be specifically spelled out in the document. Anything that is not spelled out in writing means that the person you've entrusted to make financial decisions when you're incapacitated they're not going to be able to do that. And the reason for this is back in 2011, we had a major change in Florida law. We refer to this as the superpowers. These are high levels of financial decisions that must be spelled out in your document. And in addition to being spelled out, when you go to sign your document, you have to sign either that you're giving permission to make that kind of financial decision or you're not giving permission to your agent to make that kind of decision. So let's talk about some of the top three superpowers that are important or will be important down the road. So maybe when you sign your power of attorney, there is no need to create a legal document called a trust. But down the road, your financial situation might change or the law may change and it may create a necessity for you to have a trust. It could be that the tax laws have changed and maybe 
you will potentially be taxed at death on your assets. So we would want to give the person you're naming and giving permission to, to be able to create a trust for you. Or perhaps you need to apply for Medicaid assistance, but your assets are too high or your income is too high. And so we might need to create a trust to help you qualify. So that's another reason it's important that your durable power of attorney is written in a way to meet your financial needs. We just talked a few minutes ago about a personal service agreement where somebody who's ill can compensate the caregiver by a written contract for things that they're doing to care for them. Well, if this contract hasn't been put into place when you're healthy and mentally aware, the only way that your agent is going to be able to do this is if they have authority spelled out in the durable power of attorney. So not all powers of attorney are written the same, and not every agent is going to be able to make every type of financial decision. It's going to be limited to what is written in your document. So it's important when you meet with an attorney that you share your concerns, you share what the assets are so they can anticipate or try to anticipate down the road what type of financial decisions are going to be made for you. And that should be spelled out in the document. Now, Powers of attorney are important for anybody who is over age 18, meaning they're an adult. Single people, married people, divorced people, everybody needs to have that power of attorney. It's not an issue of how wealthy somebody is. It's simply an issue of understanding that if you become incapacitated, somebody else needs legal permission to make financial decisions for you. And just being related by blood or marriage is not going to be sufficient to allow them to do that. Now we're going to explore the number five most common myth, which has to do with some misunderstandings and fallacies about Medicare and what will Medicare pay for. A lot of people hear that Medicare is going to pay for all 100 days in a rehabilitation facility. And I'm going to show you why this is not accurate. So Medicare first requires that a person have a three-day hospital stay prior to going into rehabilitation to receive therapy. Now, in the recent years, what we've learned is a lot of hospitals are not actually admitting people as patients. They are simply being admitted to the emergency room. And under the Medicare rules, being in the emergency room does not count. It is not considered an actual hospital admission. So to be a strong advocate, caregivers need to know this. They need to make sure that their loved one is actually admitted into the hospital and that they have that three-day hospital stay. If they're discharged prior to the third day, Medicare is not going to provide any financial coverage in the rehab facility. So that's where we start. Now, let's say that the person was in the hospital for three days, they were admitted, and now they've been transferred to the rehab facility. What happens? Well, the first thing that happens is Medicare covers in full 100% the cost for day one through day 20. Now, what happens after day 20 is the facility has to reevaluate the patient. Now, what used to happen up until recently is if the, if the rehab felt that the patient was not making progress, they would say, 
<clears throat> we don't believe we're going to get reimbursed by Medicare, so we're stopping therapy, and you are now a private pay patient. Are you going to pay privately for the rehab, or are you leaving? A lot of this was happening unnecessarily throughout the United States, and that led to a lawsuit being filed against the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And what came out of that lawsuit is a new rule that says progress is not the only basis for Medicare to pay for coverage. If the patient continues to need the therapies, that could be physical therapy, speech therapy, um, occupational therapy, if the patient needs the therapy to maintain the level of function they've reached, that by itself is enough. Or if continued therapy is needed to prevent decline, that also is a basis to have Medicare continue to pay 80% from day 21 through day 100. Now, one of the challenges that families can sometimes face is that if the patient has a cognitive impairment, such as dementia, it may be very challenging for the patient to follow instructions during the therapy session. Well, now, under the new rule, dementia is not a disqualifying factor for the rehab center to say, we're stopping therapy, we're not going to submit our bill to Medicare. What caregivers need to know to be effective advocates is if they're told any of this, oh, they're not progressing, um, she can't follow instructions because of the dementia, you can request that they continue the therapy and you can demand that they submit their billing to Medicare so Medicare makes the decision, not the rehab facility. So that's an important tip that every caregiver needs to know. Now, at day 100, that is the end of what Medicare will pay for in a rehab facility for everybody. If the patient were to go back into the hospital and their admitting diagnosis is something different, what's called a different spell of illness, that will restart a new 100 days. But if it is a continuation of the prior diagnosis, they don't get a new 100 days. The number four most common myth I hear is the concern that somebody is going to be held financially responsible if they sign the admission agreement at, let's say, an assisted living facility, an independent living facility, or a skilled nursing facility because the patient isn't capable of signing. Now, the reason this is not completely accurate is it's going to depend on the capacity that the caregiver is signing the agreement. It's also going to depend on language that is in the contract. So let's start with capacity. The thing I want you to keep in mind is you don't wanna just be signing your name as an individual. If you are named as the healthcare surrogate or you're named as the financial agent under the durable power of attorney, then after your name, you put that abbreviation. You might put DPOA for durable power of attorney, or you might put the word surrogate to indicate that you're signing as the medical decision maker. What that does is it sends a clear message that you're acting as a fiduciary. You're acting in the role of the surrogate decision maker. You're not acting individually. And by doing it that way, you're not going to incur any personal financial responsibility. Now, then we have to dig below the surface. So we have to look at the language in the admission agreement. 
is there language that says or refers to you as a quote responsible party this is a way that facilities will sometimes try to hold the decision maker or the caregiver personally responsible so if you see those words responsible party cross that out make it clear you're not signing as a responsible party because what they're trying to do is they're trying to create a guarantee and third party guarantees are prohibited under the law now ideally we would want the resident to sign but if the resident can't either for physical reasons or cognitive reasons then we want to see is there a power of attorney or is there a designation of healthcare surrogate the other things that caregivers need to know is that a facility cannot tell you that you must pay privately for a period of time before they'll let uh, private insurance pay, such as through a long-term care insurance policy, or before they will allow the resident to apply for Medicaid. That's prohibited. Another thing to be very careful about and why you really should have these contracts reviewed before signing them is you don't ever want to waive any legal rights that the resident may have. Okay, in fact, if they try to do that, a facility can be fined under Florida law and federal law for attempting to do that. So if you see language that says uh, the facility cannot be held responsible if you're injured on the facility premises or the facility can't be held responsible for loss of personal property, think twice. Those or the paragraphs, that's the language that we want to cross out and make it clear we're not agreeing to that. If you see language that says if there's a dispute between the resident and the facility, that the resident is agreeing to have the dispute resolved through arbitration, you are not required to agree to that nobody can force you to agree to arbitration it might not be in the resident's best interest it might be better to do what's called mediation so if you see <clears throat> that language that's an example of something that we're going to cross out and we're going to initial to indicate that's not being agreed to so the key to not being held financially responsible is to first indicate the capacity you're signing you're doing it under power of attorney or you're doing it under the healthcare surrogate and then carefully read through or have an elder law attorney read through the contract before you sign it the next most common myth that i hear has to do with confusion about veteran benefits and this is probably due to the fact that there are several different types of programs under the Veterans Administration, and they all have different eligibility requirements. So <clears throat> the myth that I hear the most is when somebody says that their parent or their spouse, who is a veteran, can't get benefits because they didn't serve in combat or they weren't injured during the period of time that they served. Now, what that's really referring to is what's called veteran disability compensation. But there's another program that a lot of people aren't aware of. It doesn't get as much publicity as it should. And that's referred to as the aid and attendance program. So it has nothing to do with whether a person was injured as a result of their service. It has nothing to do with were they actually in combat. But what we have to look at first, and we do this by looking at their honorable discharge papers, the DD-214, is they have to first meet 90 days of active duty. And at least one of those days has to be served during a declared period of war. 
Now you can go to the Veterans Administration website, it's www.va.gov, and you can find the page where they will tell you for each declared period of war, when did it begin and when did it end? So some wars, for example, like the Vietnam War, is going to have a different beginning and ending date than a lot of people tend to think. So do go to that resource so you know exactly if the veteran you're caring for meets this initial requirement. Now what aid and attendance benefits is, it's an enhanced type of pension, so it's a financial monthly benefit that helps the veteran pay for services to assist them with their daily living activities so that they can be safe in their environment, whether that environment is their private home, the home of a family member, or even an assisted living facility. It enables them to have the financial wherewithal to pay for the care they need. So examples of some of those types of medical related expenses could be hiring a home health care agency or helping to pay the room and board at an assisted living facility. So there's a lot of different ways that the financial benefit can be applied. Just so everybody is clear, the veteran benefits has nothing to do with a person's social security retirement benefit. So if you are approved for aid and attendance, you're not losing social security. You're actually going to receive both. What the VA is looking at financially, once it confirms that you meet the 90 days of active duty and the one day during a declared period of war, is they're going to look at what type of unreimbursed medical expenses is the veteran incurring. That means, what are they paying out of pocket that is not being paid or reimbursed by health insurance, whether it's payment through Medicare, um, payment through a supplement, or payment through long-term care insurance. So to the extent that the veteran can show that the amount of the unreimbursed medical expenses equals or exceeds their income sources, that shows the VA that this veteran needs their financial support. They're also then going to look at assets or what they call net worth. Now, this is a new set of rules that's only two years old. So currently, the net worth limit, and this applies regardless of whether the veteran is single or whether they're married, currently the net worth limit is $129,094. Now, that does not include the home, it does not include the car, but it does include all other types of resources, such as bank accounts, investments, that could mean certificates of deposit as well. It could mean individually held stocks or stocks in an account. The other thing to be aware of when the law changed two years ago is previously the VA did not have a transfer of asset rule like the Medicaid agency had. Now, under current rules, and this is federal law, this program's rules are more like the Medicaid rules. So the VA does have a look back period. So if there were transfers of assets by the veteran, that could delay when they're going to become eligible for aid and attendance and they're going to be looking at reporting of assets and income on the application. One helpful tip to think about is if you know of a veteran and maybe they don't have a caregiver or their caregiver needs assistance in order to complete and file the application to apply, you can contact your county's veteran service organization. They are staffed by retired veterans 
who can assist the veteran or their caregiver in filling out the application, and they can actually travel to where the veteran is. So if the veteran's in the hospital or they're in a residential community, the veteran service organization can send somebody to help the veteran because the veteran does need to sign the application. It cannot be signed by the caregiver nor can it be signed by anybody who happens to have a durable power of attorney. So even if all the veteran can do is make an X on the signature line, that is accepted by the VA. So now we're coming down to the number two most common myth that I hear which is people thinking that by having a durable power of attorney, they are able to take care of their parent's social security benefit if their parent becomes incapacitated and is unable to handle the responsibility of accepting and properly applying their social security benefit. Well, the news is that the Social Security Administration does not honor durable powers of attorney. They require that people apply to the agency to become what is called a representative payee. Now, the good news is this can be done online. A lot of forms can be found for both the Veterans Administration and the Social Security Administration on their websites. You do want to have a doctor's letter that explains why the Social Security holder is no longer capable of handling their own financial affairs. So you need that to support the application to become representative payee. Now, when you are approved to be the representative payee, you're going to be asked to set up a designated account just to hold the Social Security. Generally speaking, the administration does not want the Social Security benefit mixed with any other sources of income, such as pension or IRA distributions. So you'll have to set up a designated account. You'll arrange with the bank to have the benefit electronically deposited. Now, some good news is that years ago, a representative payee was responsible once a year to fill out an annual report telling Social Security how was the money spent. For example, how much was spent on food, how much was spent on shelter, like mortgage, rent, things like that. Well, a few years ago, Social Security decided to make it a little easier on certain representative payees. So if you are a parent and you're a payee for a minor child receiving benefits, you're no longer required to fill out that annual report. And if you're the parent of an adult child who has a disability, you're also now exempt from the annual report requirement. And if you are the representative payee for your spouse, you are also exempt from having to fill out the annual report. So now, drum roll, we're down to the number one most common myth asked or, or stated for that fact, and that is people who think that the state, and when they say the state, they really mean the Medicaid agency, that the state or the nursing home is gonna take their home if they're ill and they need skilled nursing care. So I saved this one for last because this is the one I hear most often. And it's really a shame because when people rely on misinformation, they end up making very bad decisions based on poor judgment. So if you walk away with nothing else from today, what I want you to know is we live in a state that provides very strong protection for the homestead, not just while the owner is alive, but even after they've passed away, if they have been a recipient of Medicaid assistance. So here in Florida, 
we do not count the home as an asset when somebody goes to apply for Medicaid assistance, whether that's temporarily short term or whether it's on a more permanent long term basis. What Florida does do is it puts a limit on the home equity value that will be protected. And that value has gone up every January. So we're in November. I can tell you that for the rest of this calendar year, it's been set at approximately $603,000. And we do anticipate that that figure is going to go up January 1st. So as long as the home <clears throat> is valued under that limit, the home is excluded. It does not count. The reason we want people to know the truth and not rely on misinformation is because I've seen too many times where relying on misinformation leads people to sign a deed and transfer the ownership of their home to a family member. And this is actually the worst thing that anybody can do because you're taking what is an exempt resource and by transferring it, you just created a penalty. You made a gift and you didn't get anything of value in return. So as a result, it actually causes people to be disqualified from Medicaid. So there's no reason to do that. But if you feel that there is a valid reason to transfer the homestead, you wanna make sure that it's falling into one of the very rare exceptions under the law. And one of those exceptions is when an adult child <clears throat> has been a caregiver for the parent for a minimum of two years. And we need to document this. And we usually document it in an affidavit that the caregiver signs and a separate affidavit that the parent signs. When this is properly documented, and we may also need documentation from the physician to document when the person was diagnosed and that they did in fact need the assistance of their child as a caregiver, they can still qualify for Medicaid and there is no transfer penalty. The last thing to keep in mind Again, we want clear information. We don't want people making decisions based on fear and false information is that there will be no Medicaid lien attaching to the home when the homeowner dies, as long as it's going to be inherited by family. Okay, what this means, and it doesn't matter how far removed the relative is, it could be the second cousin, it could be the third spouse. What it simply means is the law is protecting family members that inherit. Anybody outside of the family, unfortunately, that's where the Medicaid lien can attach. So if you have somebody who is not married, but they're living with somebody, they're a domestic partner, we might want to encourage those people to get married in order for that surviving partner to receive the home and not have the Medicaid lien posed against the home. So currently in Florida, there's no protection for domestic partners. So in planning for the future of a caregiver and the person that they're taking care of, it's important to have the conversation, to talk about these issues up front, to make sure that the documents are in place. And to do that, I suggest we follow the acronym CARE. The C is for to do it with compassion. The A represents accepting that people will make different decisions than you might. And the R stands for respect, to be respectful. E stands for empathy, to be able to connect with that person and try to see it from their point of view. Now I'd like to give you a couple of tips to help you 
if you haven't seen an elder law attorney, maybe you don't know where to start. So when choosing an elder law attorney, you want to ask questions about what areas do they practice in? So if you need somebody for estate planning or you need somebody for Medicaid, you want to make sure they have years of experience in those areas. You want to make sure they're not dabbling, that they don't have a general practice that is divided among a lot of different areas of law. You should ask the lawyer are they board certified? Do they have specialized knowledge? Do they charge a consul fee? And will they put their proposal in writing for you? You can even ask for a reference, a client that you can contact to ask them about their experience. And certainly you can go on the Florida Bar's website or the website for the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys to find an elder law attorney in your geographic area of Florida or the US. It's a good idea to read the attorney's website, look for reviews, look to see how customers reported their experience. Were they comfortable? Did they feel that their information was maintained in confidence? As you prepare for that meeting, Take the time to gather and to organize your financial documentation. It will make the meeting much more productive and it'll enable the attorney to be able to give you recommendations during the meeting. Also, write down your questions, your concerns, and even your fears. And I emphasize the concerns and fears because it gives the attorney the opportunity to tell you if information you've heard is true or not. And always write down your goals. What's important to you? Are you trying to maintain your privacy? Are you trying to plan for a relative who has special needs or a disability? Write it all down. You'll have the opportunity to go over it and get the answers to your questions. Make sure that you have anything that's necessary to enhance the meeting, whether that's reading glasses, hearing aids, and always be honest about any family member who has a disability, an addiction, or might be fiscally irresponsible. By you sharing that information with the elder law attorney, they're going to best be able to create a plan that's tailored to address these concerns. So I'd like to thank everybody who joined me today and give you an opportunity to unmute your microphone and ask questions about the top 10 myths we discussed today. That was very informative. I enjoyed that very much. Thank you, Rosalind. <laughs> I don't know if I have any questions right now. I'll think about it for a minute. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, remember that you can I, always go. Oh, yes. I have, it's, it's a little bit off topic. So if it is, just tell me now and move on if nobody else. But I, I'm been researching for my father for a home. And I'm trying to understand he's got long-term care insurance and I'm trying to understand the difference between assisted living and a nursing home because I'm getting different answers from different people and I'm concerned that assisted living is not covered under the long-term care policy. Okay. Like my so, mother is concerned for that. <laughs> so. Yeah. So I'm going to make um, two suggestions. One suggestion is you might want to reach out to the insurance agent that sold them the policy or bring the policy to an elder law attorney mm -hmm. to read. And in every policy, there's going to be a definition section. So it'll define, for example, um, what is assisted living, what is mm -hmm. skilled nursing level of care. So that definition section relates back to what is the coverage. Right. So it's not uniform because like some facilities we've talked to called it one thing and you know when we're describing it at the granular level 
it's like, oh, but we call this like heightened assisted living and someone else is like, oh, that's part of our skilled nursing. And um, so yeah, I'll, I'll read that. More yeah, and it, it may then be necessary to then, as I said, either call the agent and have the agent call the company or you call the insurance company directly and say, if my loved one needs this type of care, is this considered covered under your definition? Right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Any other questions? So keep in mind, we have a calendar events page on the website. You can always go there to see what's happening, either webinars or live in the community. Uh, we do record everything. Just give us a few days and it will be up on the website as well as YouTube. And I do have a quick question. I didn't realize I was muted. Yes, Rosalind. Um, regarding uh, in the, the home being inherited by heirs and family, by family, uh, is that specifically Florida or is that federal? Um, that is Florida and that is federal. Okay, so if after Ken dies and I die, and the home is inherited by his children, they Medicaid cannot um, recoup their investment um, from that asset. So I don't want to, on this recording, talk about people's personal situations. So the way I'm going to answer it is if it's going to go to a relative, there would be no Medicaid lien against it. But if it's going to somebody, like I said, who's a domestic partner or the will leaves it to a best friend, there is no protection from the Medicaid lien then. Okay. And that's federal. Yes. So I want to thank everybody and Wish everybody a very healthy and happy Thanksgiving next week. And I look forward to you joining me again next month for our next webinar. Thank you.